Hi, I'm Kat and today I have for you a true crime case, a word in Romanian and I will also be doing my makeup at the same time. So the word for today is dulciuri. 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 Well done guys, you just said sweets. And today's video was actually suggested to me by Angela, one of my YouTube viewers. And there, I know, I have another wig, which again, doesn't sit on properly. So, you know, just ignore that. It's part of the Halloween thing outfit today. Okay. To everyone in his neighborhood, Dean seemed an ordinary man. Everyone knew him for spending most of his time at the candy factory that his mother owned and he got on really well with many of the kids in the neighborhood. He would give free candy to local school children which earned him the nickname Candyman. But it turns out that Candyman had a dark secret. Dean Arnold Cole was born on December 24th, 1939 in Fort Wayne, Indiana. He was the first child of Mary Emma Robinson and Arnold Edwin Cole. Arnold was a strict father and on the other hand, Mary was really protective of both of her sons. It's like, you know, your usual classic parents, if you will, maybe good cop, bad cop, you know, stuff like that. Sadly, Dean's parents' marriage didn't go so well. They would argue a lot and it was so bad that they divorced in 1946, four years after the birth of their younger son, Stanley Wayne Corl. Mary then sold the family home and moved to a trailer home in Memphis, Tennessee, where Arnold was drafted into the United States Air Force after the divorce. Mary moved there because she really wanted her sons to have a relationship with their father. As a child, Dean was a shy boy who rarely socialized with other children, but at the same time, he did show concern for the well-being of others. When he was seven years old, he had an undiagnosed case of rheumatic fever, which was not recognized until doctors found out that Dean had a heart murmur in 1950. As a result of this diagnosis, Dean was told to avoid PE classes in school, so, you know, he wasn't really able to do any physical exercise. Dean's parents tried to make the relationship work again, so they remarried in 1950. They then moved to Pasadena, Texas, a suburb of Houston. But it didn't really last for long, and in 1953, they divorced once again. Mary got custody of both of the children. The divorce really ended amicably and both boys had regular contact with their father. After the second divorce, Dean's mother married a traveling clock salesman called Jake West. The family moved to Vider, Texas, where Dean's half-sister Joyce Janine was born. Dean's mother, along with his stepfather, decided to start a small family candy company, initially doing it from the garage of their home. From the start of their business, Dean would work day and night at the candy factory while still attending school. He and his younger brother were responsible for running the candy making machines and also for packing the product, which his stepfather in turn sold on his sales route. This route usually involved Jake traveling to Houston where much of the candy was being sold. From 1954 until 1958, Dean attended Vider High School where he was a well-behaved student achieving good grades. Here as well, Dean was seen as somewhat of a loner, although he occasionally was known to date girls in his teenage years. In high school, his only major interest was the brass band in which he played trombone. Dean graduated from Vider High School in the summer of 1958. Soon after, he, along with the family, 
moved to the northern outskirts of Houston so that the candy business could be closer to the city where the majority of the candies would be sold. They opened a new shop, naming it Pecan Prince, referring to the brand of the product. In 1960, requested by his mother, Dean moved to Indiana to live with his grandmother, who was a widow. Whilst living with her, Dean had a really close relationship with a local girl, even though he rejected a future marriage proposal that she made to him in 1962. Dean lived in Indiana for almost two years. He went back to Houston in 1962 again to help with the family's candy business, which by this point moved to Houston Heights. Dean would later move into an apartment of his own above the shop. Dean's mother divorced Jake in 1963 and opened a new candy business which she named Coral Candy Company. Dean was appointed as the vice president of the new company with his younger brother Stanley appointed secretary treasurer. The same year, one of the teenage male employees of Coral Candy Company complained to Dean's mother that Dean made sexual advances towards him. As a result, she ended up firing the employee. Dean ended up being drafted into the United States Army on August the 10th, 1964, assigned to Fort Polk, Louisiana, for basic training. He was later assigned to Fort Benning, Georgia, to train as a radio repairman before his permanent assignment to Fort Hood, Texas. According to official military records, Dean's period of service in the army was actually unblemished. Dean, however, hated military service. He applied for a hardship discharge on the grounds that he was needed to help in his family's business. The army granted his request and he was given an honorable discharge on June 11, 1965, after serving 10 months of service. Allegedly, Dean told some of his close acquaintances after his release from the army that it was during his period of service that he first realized he was homosexual and experienced his first homosexual encounters. Other acquaintances noticed small changes in uh, Dean's mannerisms when he was in the company of teenage males after he had completed his service and returned to Houston. This led them to believe he may have been homosexual. After his honorable discharge from the army, Dean returned to Houston Heights and resumed the position that he held as vice president of the Coral Candy Company. Jake, his former stepfather, retained ownership of the family's former candy business, Pick and Price, Pick and Prince after his divorce from Mary, Dean's mother, in 1963. The competition between the two companies was intense. With an increasing demand for the candies, Dean increased the number of hours that he worked. In 1965, Coral Candy Company relocated to 22nd Street, right across the street from, Hel from Helms Elementary School. Here, Dean was known to give free candy to the local children, specifically to teenage boys. Due to this, he earned himself the nicknames of Candyman and the Pied Piper. The company employed a small workforce and Dean was seen to flirt with several teenage male employees. He also installed a pool table at the back of the candy factory where employees and local youths would congregate. In 1967, Dean made friends with 12-year-old David Owen Brooks, a 6th grade student and one of the many children to whom he gave free candy. David initially became one of Dean's many close friends, many young close friends, regularly socializing with him and with other teenage boys at the back of the candy factory. David would join Dean on the regular trips that he took to South Texas beaches in the company of kids. David later said that Dean was the first adult male who didn't mock his appearance. Whenever David told Dean that he needs money, he would give it to him. 
and David began seeing Dean as a father figure. But that would soon change. Dean became quite insistent with David and gradually a sexual relationship developed. But I mean, I would probably refer to it as abuse because David was just 12 years old. Beginning in 1969, Dean would pay David cash and gifts just to let him perform oral on David. And yes, before we move any further, just a warning guys here is going to involve a lot of instances of children's assaults. David's parents were divorced and his father lived in Houston, but his mother moved to Beaumont, a city 85 miles east of Houston. In 1970, when he was 15 years old, David dropped out of Wall Trip High School and moved to Beaumont to live with his mother. Whenever he visited his father in Houston, he also went to see Dean, who let him stay at his apartment if he wanted to. Later that same year, David moved back to Houston. By his own later admission, David saw Dean's apartment as his second home. By the time David dropped out of high school, Dean's mother and his half-sister Joyce moved to Colorado after his mother's failed third marriage and also the closure of Coral Candy Company in June 1968. Even though she often talked to Dean on the phone, his mother never saw him again. After the closure of the candy company, Dean took a job as an electrician at the Houston Lighting and Power Company or HL and P, where he tested electrical relay systems. He worked there until the day of his death. Between 1970 and 1973, Dean Cole killed a minimum of 28 victims. I know, I know guys, we jumped right in all of a sudden. All of these victims were male between the ages of 13 years old and 20 years old. The majority were in their mid-twins. Most of the victims were abducted from Houston Heights, which was, at the time, a low-income neighborhood northwest of downtown Houston. But Dean actually didn't do this alone. In most of the abductions, he had the help of one or both of his teenage accomplices, David Owen Brooks and Elmer Wayne Hanley. Quite a few of the victims were actually friends of David's or Elmer's or both. Other victims were boys that Dean met before their abductions and murders. Two other victims, Billy Bolch and Gregory Melly Winkle, were former employees of Coral Candy Company, the family business. Dean would usually lure his victims into either one of the two vehicles he had, a Ford Econoline van and the Plymouth GTX or a 1969 Chevrolet Corvette that he bought for David in 1971. The boys would be lured with the promise of a party or a lift and the victim would be then driven to Dean's house. At his house the victims would be laced with alcohol or other drugs until they would pass out. Then they, they would also be tricked into putting on handcuffs or just grabbed by force. Afterwards, they were stripped naked and tied to this bed or a plywood torture board which was regularly hung on the wall. After being restrained, the victims would be sexually attacked, beaten, tortured and sometimes after a few days, they would be killed by strangulation or shot with a .22 caliber pistol. Their bodies were then tied in plastic sheathing and buried in one of four places. A rented boat shed in southwest Houston, a beach on the Bolivar Peninsula, a woodland near Lake Sam Rayburn where Dean's family owned the lakeside log cabin or a beach in Jefferson County. Several times Dean forced his victims to call or write to their parents explaining their disappearance in an effort to get the parents not to worry about their kids' safety. Dean also kept trophies from his victims, which would usually be keys. During the years of abductions and murders, Dean would change addresses quite often, probably so he's not, you know, suspected or caught. 
However, until he moved to Pasadena in the spring of 1973, he always lived in or close to Houston Heights. Dean killed his first known victim, an 18-year-old college freshman called Jeffrey Allen Conan, on 25th of September 1970. He was a student at the University of Texas at Austin. Jeffrey went missing while hitchhiking from Austin with another student from the university to his parents' home in Brazewood Place district of Houston. He was dropped off alone at the corner of Westheimer Road and South Voss Road near the uptown area of Houston at around 6.15 p.m. Dean probably offered Jeffrey a lift to his home, which he most likely accepted. At the time of his disappearance, Dean lived in the Harold Turboff Apartments, where he paid a deposit of a month's rent on September 21st. David led police to Jeffrey's body on August the 10th, 1973. Jeffrey was buried at High Island Beach. Forensic scientists later concluded that Jeffrey died of asphyxiation caused by manual strangulation and a cloth gag which was placed in his mouth. The body was found buried under a large boulder covered with a layer of lime, wrapped in plastic, naked, and bound hand and foot with nylon cord, suggesting that he had been violated. Around the time of Jeffrey's murder, David actually interrupted Dean in the act. Dean was sexually attacking two teenage boys, which were strapped to a four-poster bed. Dean promised David a car in return for his silence. When David accepted the offer, Dean bought him a green Chevrolet Corvette. He later told David that he had killed the two boys and offered him $200, the equivalent of around $1,536 as of 2023, for any boy that he could lure to Dean's apartment. On December 13, 1970, David lured 14-year-old Spring Branch teenagers called James Eugene Glass and Danny Michael Yates. They were lured away from a religious rally held in Houston Heights to Dean's Worktown apartment. James was last seen in the company of Danny walking towards the exit of the church they attended. James was a friend of David's who previously visited Dean's home. Both of the boys were tied to opposite sides of Dean's torture board. Then they were R.A.P.E.D. strangled and buried in a boat shed Dean rented on, no on November 17. An electrical cord with alligator clips attached to each end was buried alongside Danny's body. Six weeks after the double murder of James and Danny on January 30th, 1971, David and Dean met two teenage brothers, 15-year-old Donald Wayne Waldrop and 13-year-old Jerry Lynn Waldrop, walking towards their parents' home. Donald vanished on his way to visit a friend to talk about forming a bowling league. David claimed that Donald's father, who was a builder, was working on the apartment next to Dean's at the time that Donald and his brother were murdered. I can't even imagine that. I can't even imagine it. 13-year-old Jerry, the youngest of Dean's victims, was strangled along with his brother the day after they were abducted and buried in a common grave inside Dean's boat shed. The brothers had been driven to a friend's home by their father with plans to talk about forming the league. They were lured into Dean's van and driven to an apartment he rented on Mangum, on Mangum Road. Between March and May 1971, Dean abducted and killed three victims who lived in Houston Heights. They were buried toward the rear of the rented boat shed. In uh, each of these abductions, David was a participant. One of these three victims, 15-year-old Randall Lee Harvey, was uh, last seen by his family on the afternoon of 9th of March, cycling towards Oak Forest, where he worked part-time as a gas station attendant. He went missing on his way home. Randall was driven to Dean's Magnum Road apartment where he was killed by a single gunshot to the head. He was buried in the boat shed and his remains were only identified in October 2008. The other two victims, 
13 year old David William Hilgist and 16 year old Gregory Melly Winkle were abducted and killed together on the afternoon of May 29, 1971. David William, one of Elmer's earliest childhood friends, was last seen in the company of his friend Gregory walking to a local swimming pool before climbing into a white van. Gregory was a former employee of Coal Candy Company and boyfriend of Randall Harvey's sister. He last called his mother, claiming that he and David Williams were swimming in Freeport. His body was found in the boat shed with a cord used to strangle him knotted around his neck. Just as with the parents of the other victims, both sets of parents launched a frantic search for their sons. One of the boys who offered to distribute posters that the parents printed with a money reward for information leading to the boy's whereabouts was 15-year-old Elmer Wayne Henley, who was a lifelong friend of David Hillegist, one of the victims. Elmer was also one of Dean's accomplices, just like David. Elmer put up the reward posters around the Heights and even try to reassure David's parents that there could be an innocent explanation for the boy's disappearance. On 17th of August 1971, Dean and David Brooks met David's 17-year-old friend called Reuben Wilford Watson Haney. He was walking home from a movie theater in Houston. David persuaded Ruben to go to a party at an address Dean moved into on San Felipe Street. He had just moved there the previous month. Knowing David, Ruben agreed and they went to Dean's home. Ruben called his mom to tell her that he was spending the evening with David Brooks. In Dean's apartment, Ruben was strangled and buried in the boat shed. In September 1971, Dean moved again to another apartment in the Heights. David later stated that he helped Dean in the abduction and murder of two boys during the time Dean stayed at this address, including one boy who was killed just before Elmer Wayne Henley came into the picture. In his confession, David said that the boy killed immediately before Elmer's involvement in the murders was abducted from the Heights and kept alive for around four days before his murder. The identities of both of these victims actually remain unknown. In the winter of 1971, David Brooks introduced Elmer to Dean. He was most likely lured as a victim, but Dean decided that he would instead make a good accomplice so he offered him as well the same fee of $200 for any boy that he, could, that he could lure to his apartment, telling Elmer that he was involved in a white slavery ring operating from Dallas. Later on, Elmer stated that for several months he ignored Dean's offer, but he maintained a relationship with him and gradually began to see him as something of a brother type person whose work ethic he admired and in whom he could confide. At the beginning of 1972, Elmer decided to accept Dean's offer. This was mainly because he and his family needed the money. Elmer said that the first abduction he was a part of was during the time Dean lived at 925 Schuller Street, an address he moved to on February 19, 1972. If what Elmer is saying is true, then the victim was abducted from the Heights in February or early March 1972. In the statement that Elmer gave police after his arrest, he said that he and Dean picked up a boy at the corner of 11th and uh, Studwood and lured him on the promise of smoking some marijuana with them. After they got to Dean's home, Elmer cupped his own hands behind his back with himself with a key hidden in his back pocket, then tricked the victim into putting on the handcuffs before witnessing Dean bind and gag him. Elmer then left them alone, believing that the victim will be sold into the sexual slavery ring. The identity of this first victim that Elmer assisted in the abduction of remains unknown. One month later, on March 24, 1972, Elmer, David and Dean met an 18-year-old friend of Elmer's called Frank Anthony 
Aguirre. He was living a restaurant on Yale Street, on Yale Street, where he worked. Elmer called him over to Dean's van and invited him to drink beer and smoke marijuana with them at Dean's apartment. Frank had been engaged to marry Rhonda Williams, another friend of Elmer's. Frank agreed to go and followed them to Dean's home in his Rambler. There, Frank smoked marijuana before picking up a pair of handcuffs that Dean had left on his table. In response, Dean pounced on Frank, pushed him onto the table and cuffed his hands behind his back. Elmer later said that he didn't know Dean's true intentions towards Frank when he persuaded his friend to join them. In a 2010 interview, he claimed that he tried to convince Dean not to assault and kill Frank once Dean and David tied him and gagged him. But Dean refused, telling Elmer that he, RAPD, tortured and killed the other victim and he will do the same with Frank. Afterwards, Elmer helped Dean and David in burying Frank at High Island Beach. One month later, on 20th of April, Elmer helped Dean and David in the abduction of another boy, a 17-year-old called Mark Stephen Scott. Mark was well known to both Elmer and David and they were actually friends. He was grabbed by force and fought really hard against Dean's attempts to restrain him, even trying to stab his attackers with a knife. But Mark saw Elmer pointing a pistol towards him and according to David, Mark just gave up. He was tied to the torture board. He was RAPD, tortured, strangled and buried at High Island Beach. Mark was actually forced to write a letter to his parents claiming that he found a job in Austin. Sadly, his remains were never found. Before Dean moved out of the address on June 26th, Elmer helped him and David in the abduction of two more boys called Billy Bolch and Johnny DeLong. 17-year-old Billy Jean Bosch Jr. was a former employee of Coral Candy Company. 16-year-old Johnny, Johnny Ray DeLome was last seen with his friend walking to a local store. Both boys were tied to Dean's bed and after their torture and RAPE, Elmer manually strangled Billy, then shouted, Hey, Johnny! and shot Johnny in the forehead with a bullet exiting through, through his ear. Johnny pleaded with Elmer not to kill him before he was strangled. Both victims were buried at High Island Beach. Billy was forced to write a letter to his parents claiming that he and Johnny found work in Madisonville. During the time Dean lived at Schuller Street, they lured a 19-year-old called William Ridinger to the house. He was tied to the plywood board, tortured and abused by Dean. David persuaded Dean to release William, so William was actually allowed to leave the house. Another time, Elmer actually knocked David unconscious as he entered the house. Dean then tied David to his bed and assaulted him repeatedly before releasing him. But David continued to help Dean in the abductions of the victims. Dean moved to an apartment at Westcott Towers, where in the summer of 1972, he killed two more victims. The first of these victims, 17-year-old Stephen Kent Sickman, was last seen leaving a party held in the Heights shortly before midnight on July 19. He was brutally bludgeoned on the chest with a blunt instrument. He suffered several fractured ribs before he was strangled with a nylon cord. He was buried in the boat shed. His remains were misidentified in December 1993 and correctly identified in March 2011. One month later, around August 21st, a 19-year-old called Roy Eugene Banton was abducted while walking to his job as an assistant in a Houston shoe store. He was gagged with a section of Turkish towel and his mouth was bound with adhesive tape. He was shot twice in the head and buried in the boat shed. His remains were misidentified in October 1973 and correctly identified in November 2011. On October the 3rd, 1972, Elmer and David met two Heights teenagers, 14-year-old Wally J. Simono and 13-year-old Richard Edward Hembry, walking to Richard's home. Richard was last seen alongside his friend in a vehicle parked outside the Heights grocery store. 
They were both lured into David's Corvette on the night of October the 2nd and driven to Dean Westcott Tower's apartment. That evening, Wally called his mother's home, shouting the word Mama into the receiver before the connection was terminated. The next morning, Richard, the other boy, was accidentally shot in the mouth by Elmer with a bullet exiting through his neck. A few hours later, both boys were strangled to death and buried in a common grave inside the boat shed directly above the bodies of James Glass and Danny Yates. The next month, an 18-year-old Oak Forest boy known to Dean and Elmer, 18-year-old Willard Carmen Branch Jr. disappeared around November the 1st while hitchhiking from Mount Pleasant to Houston. He was the son of an HPD officer, police department officer. Willard was emasculated before he was shot in the head and buried in the boat shed. His remains were identified in July 1985. His father died of a heart attack in the search for his son. On November 15, a 19-year-old Spring Branch boy named Richard Allen Kepner disappeared on his way to call his fiancée from a phone booth. He was strangled and buried at High Island Beach. His remains were identified in September 1983. Altogether, at least 10 teenagers between the ages of 13 and 19 were murdered between February and November 1972, five of whom were buried at High Island Beach and five inside the boat shed. On January 20th, 1973, Dean moved yet again on Ward Road in the Spring Branch district of Houston. Within two weeks of moving in, he killed 17-year-old Joseph Allen Lyles. Joseph lived on Antoine Drive, the same street where David lived in 1973. Joseph was buried at Jefferson County Beach. His remains were located in August 1983 and identified in November 2009. Between February the 1st and June the 4th, 1973, no one was killed as far as we know. Dean suffered from a hydrocele in early 1973. Around the time of Joseph's murder, Elmer moved away to Mount Pleasant, trying to distance himself from Dean. From June, though, Dean's rate and brutality of the killings increased dramatically. On June the 4th, Elmer and Dean abducted 15-year-old William Ray Lawrence. He was last seen alive by his father on 31st Street. He was a friend of Elmer's who called his father to ask if he could go fishing with some friends. After three days of abuse and torture, he was strangled before being buried at Lake Sam Rayburn. Less than two weeks later, 20-year-old Raymond Stanley Blackburn was abducted, strangled and buried at Lake Sam Rayburn. Raymond was a married man from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. He vanished while hitchhiking from the Heights to see his newborn child. He had arrived in Houston three months before his abduction to work on a construction project. He was strangled by Dean at his Lamar Drive residence and buried at Lake Sam Rayburn. On July the 6th, 1973, Elmer began attending classes at the coach's driving school in Bel Air, where he became friends with 15-year-old Homer Luis Garcia. The next day, Homer called his mother to say that he was spending the night with a friend. He was shot and left to bleed to death in Dean's bathtub before he was buried at Lake Sam Rayburn. Five days later, on July 12, 17-year-old John Manning Sellers of Orange County was bound, shot to death, and buried at High Island Beach. He was killed two days before his 18th birthday by four gunshots to the chest. He was the only victim to be buried fully clothed. In July 1973, after David Brooks married his pregnant fiance, Elmer was the only one bringing victims to Dean, assisting in the abduction and murder of three Heights boys between July 19 and 25. One of these three victims, 15-year-old Michael Anthony Bolch, the brother of previous victim Billy Bolch, was last seen by his family on July 19 on his way to get a haircut. He was strangled and buried at Lake Sam Rayburn. His remains were identified in September 2010. His older brother Billy was killed just the previous year. The other two victims, uh, Charles Carey Cobble and Marty Ray Jones, were abducted together on the afternoon of July 25th. 
Elmer later buried both of their bodies in the boat shed. 17-year-old Charles, a school friend of Elmer, whose wife was pregnant at the time of his murder, last called his father in a state of hysteria, claiming that he and Marty were kidnapped by drug dealers. His body, shot twice in the head, was found in the boat shed. 18-year-old Marty was last seen along with his friend Charles, walking along 27th Street with Elmer. He was strangled with a Venetian, with a Venetian, Vene, Venetian blind cord and buried in the boat shed. On August the 3rd, 1973, Dean killed his last victim, a 13-year-old boy from South Houston named James Stanton Dremala. James was the son of Seventh-day Adventists who was last seen riding his bike in Pasadena. James was abducted by David and Dean while riding his bike and driven to Lamar Drive on the pretense of collecting empty glass bottles to resell. He last called his parents to tell them that he was at a party across town. He was tied to Dean's torture board, RAPED, tortured and strangled with a cord before being buried in the boat shed. David later described James as a small blonde boy for whom he bought pizza and spent 45 minutes together before James was attacked. On the evening of August the 7th, 1973, Elmer, aged 17 by then, invited a 20-year-old called Timothy Cordell Curley to go to a party at Dean's Pasadena residence. Timothy, a, ca a casual acquaintance of Dean's, who was supposed to be his next victim, accepted the offer. David Brooks was not there at the time. They both got to Dean's house where they sniffed paint fumes and drank alcohol until midnight before leaving the house promising to get back soon. Elmer and Timothy drove back to Houston Heights and Timothy parked his car close to Elmer's home. The two got out of the car and Elmer, hearing commotion across the street coming from the home of his 15-year-old friend, Rhonda Louise Williams went towards her home. Rhonda had a sprained ankle and she was being beaten by her drunken father that evening. She accepted Elmer's invitation to join him and Timothy at Dean's home. Rhonda climbed into the back seat of, Timothy, of Timothy's Volkswagen and they drove to Dean's home. At around 3 a.m. on the morning of August the 8th, 1973, Elmer, Timothy and Rhonda got to Dean's house. Dean was furious that Elmer brought a girl to his house, telling him in private that he ruined everything. Elmer explained that Rhonda argued with her father that evening and didn't want to go back home. Dean seemed to be, you know, okay after that and all of them had beer and marijuana. The three teenagers began drinking and smoking marijuana. Elmer and Timothy were also sniffing paint fumes, whilst Dean was watching them. After two hours, Elmer, Timothy and Rhonda passed out. Elmer woke up on his stomach with Dean snapping handcuffs onto his wrists. His mouth was taped shut and his ankles were bound together. Timothy and Rhonda were laying next to him, bound with nylon rope, gagged with adhesive tape and lying face down on the floor. Timothy was stripped naked. Seeing that Elmer woke up, Dean removed the gag. Dean told him that he was angry at him for bringing a girl to his house and that he was going to kill all three of them after he assaulted and tortured Timothy, initially saying, man, you blew it bringing that girl, before shouting, I'm gonna kill you all, but first I'm gonna have my fun. He then repeatedly kicked Rhonda in the chest before lifting Elmer to his feet dragging him into his kitchen and placing a .22 caliber pistol against his stomach, threatening to shoot him. Elmer managed to calm Dean down, promising to participate in the torture and murder of both Rhonda and Timothy, his friends, if he would be released. After around half an hour, Dean agreed and untied him, then carried Timothy and Rhonda into his bedroom and tied them to opposite sides of his torture board. Timothy on his stomach and Rhonda on her back. Dean handed Elmer a hunting knife and ordered him to cut away Rhonda's clothing, insisting that while he would RAP and kill Timothy, Elmer would do the same to Rhonda. Elmer started cutting away Rhonda's clothes and Dean undressed and began to assault and torture Timothy. Both Timothy and Rhonda woke up by this point. Timothy began shouting and Rhonda lifted her head and asked Elmer if this was for real, to which Elmer said yes. 
Rhonda then asked him, are you going to do anything about it? Elmer asked Dean if he could take Rhonda into another room, but Dean completely ignored him. Elmer then grabbed Dean's pistol, shouting, You've gone far enough, Dean. I can't go on any longer. I can't have you kill all my friends. Dean told Elmer, Kill me, Wayne. Elmer stepped back a few paces as Dean continued to go toward him, shouting, You won't do it. Elmer fired at him, hitting him in the forehead. The bullet failed to fully penetrate Dean's skull and he continued going towards Elmer. He fired another two rounds, hitting Dean in the left shoulder. Dean ran out of the room, hitting the wall of the hallway. Elmer fired three more bullets into his lower back and shoulder as Dean slid down the wall in the hallway outside the room where the two other teenagers were bound. Dean Coral died where he fell, his naked body lying face toward the wall. Finally, finally he stopped. Elmer said that right after he shot Dean, all he could think about was that Dean would have been proud of the way he behaved during the confrontation. Dean had been training him to react quickly and forcefully and that was exactly what he did more like grooming him, grooming both of them actually, both David and Elmer. After Elmer shot Dean, he and Timothy started crying as Timothy repeatedly thanked him for saving his life. Elmer released Timothy and Rhonda from the torture board and all three teenagers got dressed and talked about what they should do. Elmer told Timothy and Rhonda that they should just leave, to which Timothy replied, no, we should call the police. Elmer agreed and looked up the number for the Pasadena Police Department in Dean's phone directory. At 8.24 a.m. on August the 8th, 1973, Elmer called the police. His call was answered by an operator called Velma Lines. He told the operator that, that they should just get there straight away because he just killed a man. Whilst waiting for the police, Elmer told Timothy that he killed like that four or five times before. When the police arrived, Elmer pointed to the body in the house and said it was him who did it. The officer took him to his car and read his Miranda rights. In response, Elmer shouted, I don't care who knows about it, I have to get it off my chest. In custody, Elmer was initially questioned about the killing of Dean. He told the police what happened, saying he killed Dean in self-defense. The statements given by Timothy and Rhonda corroborated his account and the detective questioning Elmer believed that he did act in self-defense. When questioned regarding his claim that he had killed several boys, Elmer said that for almost three years, David and him helped bring teenage boys to Dean, some of whom had been their own friends. Dean had the RAPD and murdered them. Elmer said he initially believed the boys he abducted were to be sold into a Dallas-based organization for homosexual acts, sodomy, maybe later killing, but he soon learned that Dean was himself killing the victims. He admitted he assisted Dean in several abductions and murders, and he actively participated in the torture and mutilation of six or eight victims before their murder. Most of the victims had been buried in a southwest Houston boat shed with others buried at Lake Sam Rayburn and High Island Beach. Dean had paid up to $200 for each victim David or Elmer were able to lure to his apartment. At first, police didn't really believe Elmer's claims, assuming that the only murder was that of Dean. Elmer was quite insistent though and, even, and when he mentioned the names of three boys, Cobble, Hillegist and Jones, whom he stated he and David Brooks procured for Dean Call, the police accepted that there was something to his claims, as all three teenagers were listed as missing at Houston Police Department headquarters. Hillegist was reported missing in the summer of 1971. The other two boys had been missing for two weeks. Also, the floor of the room where the three teenagers had been tied was covered in thick plastic sheathing. Police also found a plywood torture board measuring 8 by 3 feet with handcuffs attached to nylon rope at two corners and nylon ropes to the other two. There was also a large hunting knife, rolls of clear plastic of the same type used to cover the floor, a portable radio rigged to a pair of dry cells to give increased volume, an electric motor with loose wires attached, eight pairs of handcuffs, a number of dildos, thin glass tubes and lengths of rope.
This for the corner line van parked in the driveway gave a similar impression. The rear windows of the van were sealed by opaque blue curtains. In the rear of the vehicle, police found a coil of rope, a swatch of beige rug covered in soil stains and a wooden crate with air holes drilled in the sides. The pegboard walls inside the rear of the van were rigged with several rings and hooks. Another wooden crate with air holes drilled in the sides was found in Dean's backyard. Inside this crate, there were several strands of human hair. Elmer agreed to go with police to Dean's boat shed in southwest Houston, where he claimed the bodies of most of the victims could be found. Inside the boat shed, police found a half-stripped stolen car, a child's bike, a large iron drum, water containers, two sacks of lime, and a large plastic bag full of teenage boys' clothing. Two prison trustees started digging through the soft earth of the boat shed and soon uncovered the body of a blonde-haired teenage boy lying on his side encased in clear plastic and buried beneath a layer of lime. Police continued excavating through the earth of the shed, unearthing the remains of more victims in varying stages of decomposition. Most of the bodies found were wrapped in thick, clear plastic sheathing. Some victims had been shot, others strangled, the ligatures still wrapped tightly around their necks. All of the victims found were sodomized and most of the victims found had evidence of sexual torture. Pubic hairs had been plucked out, genitals had been chewed, objects had been inserted into their rectums and glass rods had been inserted into their urethra and smashed. Cloth rags had also been inserted into the victims' mouths and adhesive tape wound around their faces to muffle their screams. The tongue of the first victim uncovered protruded over one inch beyond the tooth margin. The mouth of the third victim unearthed on August the 8th was so agape that all upper and lower teeth were visible, leading investigators to theorize that the boy died screaming. After the recovery of the eighth body from the boat shed was completed at 11.55 p.m., the investigation was stopped until the next day. Accompanied by his father, David Brooks presented himself at police headquarters on the evening of August the 8th and gave a statement in which he denied any participation in the murders, but admitted to having known that Dean had RAPED and killed two boys in 1970. On the morning of August the 9th, Elmer gave a full written statement detailing his and David's involvement with Dean in the abduction and murder of numerous boys. In this confession, he admitted to having personally killed approximately nine boys and to have assisted Dean in the strangulation of others. He stated the only three abductions and murders David didn't assist in were committed in the summer of 1973. That afternoon, Elmer, Elmer went with the police to Lake Sam Rayburn, where he, David and Dean buried four victims killed that year. Two more bodies were found in shallow, lime-soaked graves close to a dirt road. Inside the lakeside lock cabin owned by Dean's family, police found a second plywood torture board, rolls of plastic sheathing, shovels and a sack of lime. Police found nine more bodies in the boat shed on August the 9th. These bodies were recovered between 12.05 p.m. and 8.30 p.m. and all were in an advanced state of decomposition. The twelfth body unearthed had evidence of sexual mutilation. The, the severed genitals of the victim were found inside a sealed plastic bag placed beside the body. Another victim unearthed had several fractured ribs. The 13th and 14th bodies unearthed had identification cards naming the victims as Donald and Jerry Waldrop. David Brooks gave a full confession on the evening of August the 9th, admitting to being present at several killings and assisting in several burials, although he continued to deny any direct participation in the murders. David said that once the victims were on the torture board, they were as good as dead. He also said that witnessing the victims' deaths didn't bother him. He agreed to accompany police to High Island Beach to assist in the search for the bodies of the victims. On August the 10th, 1973, Elmer again accompanied police to Lake Sam Rayburn, where two more bodies were found buried just 10 feet apart. Both victims had been tortured and severely beaten, particularly around the head. That afternoon, both David and Elmer accompanied police to High Island Beach, 
leading police to the shallow graves of two victims. On August 13, Elmer and David again accompanied the police to High Island Beach, where four more bodies were found, making a total of 27 known victims, the worst killing spree in American history at the time. Elmer initially insisted that there were two more bodies to be found inside the boat shed and that the bodies of two more boys were buried at High Island Beach in 1972. At the time, the killing spree was the worst case of serial murders in terms of the number of victims in the U.S., exceeding the 25 murders attributed to Juan Corona, who had been arrested in California in 1971, for killing 25 men. The record number of known victims attributed to a single murder case set by Dean Cole and his accomplices was exceeded only in 1978 by John Wayne Gacy, who killed 33 boys and young men and who admitted to being influenced by press coverage of the Houston mass murders to manacle his victims before their abuse and murder. The families of these victims were highly critical of the police, which were quick to list the missing boys as runaways not being considered worthy of any major investigation. The families of the murdered victims said that the police should have noticed a trend in the pattern of disappearances of teenage boys from the Heights neighborhood. Other family members complained the police was dismissive of their insistence that their sons had no reasons to run away from home. Everett Waldrop, the father of Donald and Jerry Waldrop, complained that shortly after his sons disappeared in 1971, he informed police that someone saw Dean burying what seemed to be bodies at his boat shed. In response, police performed a brief search around the boat shed before dismissing the reports as a hoax. Everett visited the police court, the police on numerous occasions and the police chief simply told him, why are you down here? You know your boys are runaways. The mother of Gregory Melly Winkle stated, you don't run away from home with nothing but a bathing suit and 80 cents. By May 1974, 21 of these victims were identified with all apart from four boys having either lived in or had close connections to Houston Heights. Two more teenagers were identified in 1983 and 1985, one of whom, Richard Kepner, lived in Spring Branch. The other boy, Willard Branch, lived in the Oak Forest district of Houston. On August 13, a grand jury convened in Harris County to hear evidence against Elmer Henley and David Brooks. The first witnesses to testify were Rhonda and Timothy, who testified to the events of August the 7th and 8th, leading to the death of Dean. Another witness who testified to his experience at the hands of Dean was William Riedinger. After listening to over six hours of testimony from various people, on August 14, the jury initially indicted Elmer Henley on three counts of murder and David Brooks on one count. Bail for each was set at $100,000. The district attorney requested that Elmer Henley undergo psychiatric examination to determine if he was mentally competent to stand trial, but his attorney, Charles Melder, opposed the decision, stating the move would violate his constitutional rights. By the time the grand jury completed its investigation, Elmer had been indicted for six murder and David for four. Elmer Henley was not charged with, a death, with the death of Dean Cole, which prosecutors ruled on September 18 that he was committed in self-defense. Elmer Wayne Henley and David Owen Brooks were tried separately for their roles in the murders. Elmer was brought to trial in San Antonio on the 1st of July 1974, charged with six murders committed between March 1972 and July 1973. The prosecution called dozens of witnesses, including Timothy Curley and William Riedinger. William testified that at Dean's home he was tied to the torture board and assaulted repeatedly by Dean before he was released. Throughout the trial, the state introduced 82 pieces of evidence, including Dean Cole's torture board and one of the boxes used to transport the victims. Inside the box, police found hair, which examiners concluded came from both Charles Cobble and Elmer Henley. 
Elmer didn't take the stand to testify. His attorney, William Gray, cross-examined several witnesses, but didn't call any witnesses or experts for the defense. On 15th of July 1974, both counsels presented their closing arguments to the jury. The prosecution seeking life imprisonment, the defense, a verdict of not guilty. In his closing argument to the jury, District Attorney Carol Vance apologized for him not being able to seek the death penalty, adding that the case was the most extreme example of man's inhumanity to man I have ever seen. The jury deliberated for 92 minutes before finding Elmer Hanley guilty of all six murders for which he was tried. The following day, on July 16, formal procedures to sentence him for the six guilty verdicts began. And on August the 8th, Judge Preston Dial ordered that Elmer Hanley serve each 99-year sentence consecutively, totaling 594 years, and he was transferred to the Huntsville unit to formally begin his sentence. Elmer appealed his sentence and conviction, trying to argue the jury in his initial trial had not been sequestered, that his attorney's objections to news media being present in the courtroom had been overruled and citing that his defense team's attempt to present evidence contending that the initial trial should not have been held in San Antonio had also been overruled by the judge. Elmer's appeal was upheld and he was awarded a retrial in December 1978. The retrial began on June 18, 1979. This second trial was held in Corpus Christi, being represented by the same attorneys. They again tried to have Elmer's written statements ruled inadmissible. However, Judge Noah Kennedy ruled that the written statements given by Elmer on August 9, 1973 as admissible evidence. The retrial lasted nine days with Elmer's attorneys again calling no defense witnesses and again attacking the credibility of his written confession. The defense also argued that the evidence provided by the state belonged to Dean Cole, not Elmer Wayne Hanley. On June 27, 1979, the jury deliberated for over two hours before reaching their verdict. Hanley was again convicted of six murders and sentenced to six concurrent 99-year terms. David Brooks was brought to trial on February 27, 1975. He had been indicted for four murders committed between December 1970 and June 1973, but was brought to trial, charged only with the June 1973 murder of 15-year-old William Ray Lawrence. His defense attorney, Jim Skelton, argued that his client didn't commit any murders and tried to portray Dean and Elmer as being the active participants in the actual killings. Assistant District Attorney Tommy Dunn dismissed this at one point telling the jury this defendant was in on this killing, this murderous rampage from the very beginning. He tells you he was a cheerleader if nothing else. That's what he was telling you about his presence. You know he was in on it. David's trial lasted less than one week. The jury deliberated for 90 minutes, for 90 minutes before they reached a verdict. He was found guilty of William Lawrence's murder on March the 4th, 1975, and sentenced to life imprisonment. He showed no emotion as the sentence was passed, although his wife burst into tears. David also appealed his sentence, arguing that the signed confessions used against him were taken without being informed of his legal rights, but his appeal was dismissed in May 1979. Elmer Henley is serving his life sentence at the Mark Stiles unit in Jefferson County, Texas. Successive parole applications dating from July 1980 have been denied. He is next eligible for parole in October 2025. David Brooks served his life sentence at the Terrell unit near Roche Heron, Texas. He died of COVID-19 related complications at the Galston Hospital on May 28, 2020 at the age of 65. Dean Cole and his accomplices are known to have killed a minimum of 28 teenagers and young men between September 1970 and August 1973, although it's suspected that the true number of victims is higher. As Dean was killed immediately before his murders were discovered, the true number of victims will never be known. 27 of Dean's known victims have been identified and the identity of a 28 victim whose body has never been found Mark Scott is conclusively known. 
All of these victims were killed by either shooting, strangulation or a combination of both. Dean Cole's only known unidentified victim, the 16th body found in the boat shed, was in an advanced stage of decomposition at the time of his discovery, leading investigators to deduce that he was likely killed in 1971 or 1972. The victim was found wearing red, white and blue striped swimming trunks, cowboy boots, a leather bracelet and a long-sleeved khaki collar t-shirt, decorated with a peace symbol leading investigators to conclude that he was likely killed in the summer months. The victim had dark hair and may have had spina bifida, a congenital disability that could have affected his gait or caused cro chronic pain. This victim was referred to as John Houston Doe since the discovery of his body, but is also informally known as Swimsuit Boy. He was found buried near the entrance to the boat shed between the bodies of Stephen Sigman and Reuben Haney. The bodies of the victims killed between December 1970 and May 1971 were found buried at the rear of the shed. It's likely that the unidentified 16th victim found within the boat shed may have been killed in the late summer or early fall of 1971. In 2022, authorities announced that the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children and the Harris County Institute of Forensic Science are actively working together to identify this victim. An updated facial reconstruction was released to the media in August 2023. 42 boys vanished within the Houston area between 1970 and Dean Cole's death in 1973 but there was no more investigation from the police. Former workers at Coral Candy Company remembered that Dean was doing a lot of digging in the years leading up to 1968, when his mother's third marriage was falling apart and the business was failing. Dean had said that he was bearing spoiled candy to avoid contamination by insects. He then cemented over the floor. He was also observed digging in waste ground, which was later converted into a parking lot. Former workers also recalled that Dean had rolls of clear plastic, precisely the same type used to bury his victims. Co-workers at HLMP would also state that from the earliest days of his employment, Dean repeatedly retained coils of used nylon cord that would otherwise have been discarded. This brand of cord was the same type used to strangle and bind the bodies of many of his victims. The suspicion is that Dean Cole began killing much earlier than 1970 and had been abusing youths prior to this date. In one interview, David Brooks claimed that Dean's first murder victim was a youth killed at an apartment complex located at 1353 Judy Way Street, where Dean had lived between October the 7th and November the 10th, 1968, and when David himself was 13 years old. In February 2012, a picture was released to the news media of a likely unknown victim of Dean. The color Polaroid image was found in the personal possessions of Elmer Henley, which had been stored by his family since his arrest in 1973. The image depicts a blonde-haired teenage boy in handcuffs strapped to a device on Dean's floor alongside a toolbox known to contain various instruments Dean used to torture his victims. The boy was ruled out by the Harris County Medical Examiner as being any of Dean's known victims, including his one remaining known unidentified victim. Elmer said that the picture must have been taken after he bought a Polaroid camera in 1972, although he's adamant that he has no idea who this boy is. Given that Elmer met Dean in 1972, it's likely this boy would have been killed in 1972 or 1973. During a routine investigation in February 1975, the HPD discovered a large stash of pornographic pictures and films depicting boys as young as eight, most of whom were from the Heights. From the 16 individuals in the films and photos, 11 of them appeared to be among Dean's known victims who had been identified by this date. Other individuals were underage at the time the images and films were taken, but reached the legal age of consent by the time of the discoveries. The discovery raised the possibility that the statements Dean Cole had given to Elmer and David that he was associated with an organization based in Dallas, which bought and sold boys, may have held a degree of truth.
The discovery of the material in Houston in 1975 led to the arrest of five individuals in Santa Clara, California. No direct link to Dean was proven as the HPD declined to pursue any possible link to the killings, stating that they felt Dean's victims' families suffered enough. If the police would have listened earlier to the families, there wouldn't be as many victims as there were. Because all of them, because they thought that all of the missing boys, they are just runaways rather than, you know, conducting a proper investigation. Anyway, thank you guys so much for staying with me. This was a handful, wasn't it? It was a very long video and horrible how many victims he had. It's just horrible. Thanks again guys for watching. Please do let me know what do you think in the comment section down below. For now, stay safe, take care and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!